about what should what's what's happening in the public libraries, where are we going with that? And it was great, but half the people who came were librarians and they were again directors of large libraries. The other half of the people who came were business people, futurists, and that's that's great. These are probably very good ideas. But most of the country is sort of yes. wild and rural and open spaces. And the issues that we have in Boston in public libraries and in really all sorts of urban life are not relevant out west. So, uh, or not relevant in smaller places. So asking them what specifically they wanted was going to be an important part of it. Sorry, you mind your so I, I just need to set up the trail trail because yes. I like the ambiance of the park trail. So people who said you, that you live out in the West, other people I assume you've been to the West part of the country. It's nice. So yeah, at one point for a few days I was with my husband, and I said something about, oh, I already went to my library. I was only going to one library today. I did that already. So I'm done. And there's nothing else to do. There's nothing for me to see. And he just went like this and sort of. I'm like, okay, well, besides the amazingly beautiful scenery everywhere, and as he does this, I'm not kidding, you couldn't have made this up, we're standing on the side of a mountain, and a bald eagle flies on <laughs> Well, that was cool. <laughs> so, just the ambiance, and, and it's, I was, I was talking about Boston a lot with people who I visited this summer. Because everybody said, ooh, Boston. A couple people said, ooh, you have bombings there. I really wanted to talk about that, and I have to say scary people a little bit. Um, met a few scary people on the road. But they wanted to talk about Boston, and I said, well, it's just different. Boston's history, the things that Boston seems to focus in on a lot is the Revolutionary War. And I mean, that's interesting, and I've learned a lot of neat things since I've been here about that. But Lewis and Clark don't really enter everyday thoughts of people here. Um, in the same way that they do when in these communities that are on the Lewis and Clark Trail, and you can speak specifically to yours if you'd like, but um, there are, everything out there is named after them. So every town that I visited has a Jefferson Street. Um, most of them have uh, statues or other sorts of things that are relevant to the, uh, the Lewis and Clark Trail. Um, Every, everything is named Lewis, there, everything is named Clark. I was in Lewiston, uh, Lewiston, Idaho, and Clarkston, Washington. They're right across the river from each other. <laughs> so cute. Uh, yeah, it's just, it was amazing. Uh, I learned, sorry. I guess I would say one of the main things that I feel like I took away from this summer, not just from the public library trip, although definitely the public library research, but how little I know <laughs> about everything. It's, it's shocking. Um, things that are being discussed, issues that are very important in a lot of the places that I visited, don't enter into my daily life in any way. I mean, I give really something very close to 0% of my time thinking about fracking. <laughs> in North Dakota, every day I was there, every day that I saw a newspaper, every story on the front page is about fracking because it's huge. It's bringing in tons of money. Several of the libraries were telling me, oh, look at the building that we've built with this oil money. And man, I'm telling you though, if you're driving around western uh, North Dakota, it's really beautiful. It's a very beautiful area. But it was me and oil trucks <laughs> and oil wells and things on fire and gloomy, weird air. But, so from a larger perspective, that to things like, I didn't know that different areas of the country feel very strongly about their version of Sacagawea. To the extent that Sacagawea is not actually her name everywhere. Um, when I was, in, again, in the areas of like North Dakota, South Dakota, some parts of Montana, it's Sacagawea. Um, so I camped one night on the lakes of Sacagawea in one state, and I camped one night on the, on the shores of uh, Lake Sacagawea in a different state. Just, it's very different. And I know travel is always broadening like this, but this was an extreme example of it because I did spend most of the summer with me and my Jeep and my tent and 
my, my little, he, he's not here right now because he's in the display cabinet in the hallway, my little stuffed version of uh, Seaman the Newfoundland Dog. When Lewis and Clark did their adventures, uh, Lewis was getting ready uh, and he stopped off in Philadelphia to visit with some doctors, including Benjamin Rush. And one of the things that he did while he was preparing for the trip was he bought this giant Newfoundland dog named Seaman. <laughs> Seaman turned out to be really helpful on the trip. So one night uh, they were camping out someplace in South Dakota-ish and a herd of buffalo came apparently very close to trampling them all to death while they were sleeping. But Seaman woke up in time and barked and drove the buffalo aside just enough that they were saved. <laughs> So having those kinds of, having uh, Seaman, my, my main travel companion, and admittedly, he was stuffed, but you know, still, he was a very quiet travel companion. When I wanted to stop off at things, he was cool with that. He was really great. <laughs> so kind of the, having that ambiance of being very alone, uh, very isolated, uh, very, very little access to my cell phone, to the internet, uh, most places I was at, these things didn't work at all. It really gave, I think, a very interesting kind of look to the data that I was collecting. And then the how of what I was doing is by Jeep. Um, so I borrowed my dad's Jeep this summer. <laughs> I don't think he was planning on me doing as much driving as I did. So it ended up being, I, the, the odometer flipped over right at the end and I lost track of the, the miles. But it ended up being over 10,000 miles that I drove this summer. It was a lot. He was surprised when he got it back. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> but the enormous amount of planning, and I just definitely want to say thank you to many students who were involved in planning this trip for quite a long time. One of the things that we did was inspired by my students, actually. We set up a Kickstarter last semester, and that turned out to be so awesome. <laughs> Are you guys familiar with the concept of Kickstarter? It's crowdfunding things. So the project didn't get funded. But I met so many neat people who emailed me and they're like, oh, great, I saw your name on a listserv. I saw this project on some listserv that I was on. And I have, a, I have a spare room in my house if you want to stay when you come by. Or, well, we're not actually on the Lewis and Clark Trail, but we're in the same state. Would you come by my library too? <laughs> and it was really, I mean, it really gave me a very positive boost right at the beginning. Uh, but just. In terms of planning, everything, in re and I say this to my students who are doing research, everything always takes much more time than you think it's going to. That was so much the case here, where I had to plan out every place that I was going to be staying, make reservations, and pay for it in advance. Um, this turned out to be more challenging than I had expected in some places where it was a struggle for me to find a place that I could camp and take a shower <laughs> um, because I couldn't just show up at people's library like I've been wearing these clothes for three days how you doing would you like to take me seriously as a professional <laughs> that was not going to work at all so putting things together in the beginning and figuring out how to make them work uh, it just it took monumentally more time than I ever would have expected so now we're going to look at a few um, just sort of images of where I was at because I feel like, again, this really helped to inform a lot of what I did. So stage one was starting out. And I started in St. Louis, Missouri. Has anybody been to the Arch? <clears throat> it's lovely. Technically, well, I'm from near St. Louis. I grew up near there. And yeah, we all call it the Arch, right? It's technically the Jefferson National Monument of Expansion. I'm close. That's not it exactly. But yeah. And it's it's for, uh, it's, it's uh, in honor of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, uh, named after President Jefferson, who's the one who got everybody started off. But I like this because it really gave kind of a fun, exciting feel at the very beginning. Um, I stopped, I ate dinner that night at a restaurant in St. Louis, and I was the only person in there. So I said to the waiter, I'm like, yeah, this looks good, I've never had, but I remember what I ordered for dinner. I was like, I feel like dessert. I should have some sort of dessert. I'm like, what's, what's good here? He's like, oh, let me bring you something. And so he brings me gooey butter cake. Has anybody ever had gooey butter cake? I never heard of this stuff. It has a Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it's a St. Louis specialty. And 
this was kind of a neat way, I think, to get started because it really showed me all of the interesting little regional things that I was going to be seeing. So not only food, but also ideas and um, fun things. So, uh, sorry, my picture seemed to be a little convoluted here. But, so I went from Missouri, and we're following the Lewis and Clark Trail along the Missouri River. So across Missouri and up through, take a, take a right when you get to Kansas. So go through Kansas and then following the river along through uh, Iowa and Nebraska and South Dakota. So <coughs> my stage one. And I was amazed, although I guess I shouldn't have been, at everything Lewis and Clark. I mean, literally, I mean, obviously there are road signs. Has anybody been out on the roads and you've seen the Lewis and Clark trail signs? Um, well, they're, they're everywhere. Um, on the trail. And I have a couple examples of different states and how they've kind of adapted them later. But everywhere I went, so this is, I was just at some little park in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And this is a statue of Lewis and Clark Hardy and having their first negotiations with the Indian tribes that they met there. Um, and it's all, same in the Newfoundland, obviously. It was an important part of a lot of the statues. And this one was so adorable, I patted it. Um, on this first part of the trip, I was pretty much by myself most of the places that I was at. I guess school wasn't really out yet. Um, and it was very quiet. So I really enjoyed this. Uh, but I was in Lewis and Clark State Park. I gotta be honest, I don't remember which state I was in. Everyone has a Lewis and Clark State Park. But I was really mad because I had been trying to stay in the Lewis and Clark State Park. I wanted to camp there and it was filled. And I was like, why? Um, and it was because they were having Lewis and Clark days when I got there. And so they have replicas of these ships called Perogues. I'm not sure I'm even saying that right. Uh, but I think that's how uh, the Lewis and Clark writer says it. So, But anyway, this is the replica of the ship that they were on. So I'm sitting on the little ship and I'm thinking, Wow, I'm glad I got on this ship. Boy, I love my GPS. <laughs> <laughs> I was lost one day driving through Dakota City, um, I think Nebraska. And I was turned around. I wasn't in the right place because my GPS wasn't always getting good signals. And I just drove past this, and I was like, hey, that looked like a Newfoundland. I should turn around. <laughs> so I look around the block, and I come back. And this is indeed a statue of Seamoth the Newfoundland. Um, and all of these plants are plants that Lewis and Clark found on their journey and had been taken back to, I believe I'm in Nebraska. <laughs> And it just planted there. I mean, there's no big sign about it. The only way you know is, well, semen is painted sort of blue. But, uh, I mean, it stands out a little bit. But, I mean, I don't know what the population of this town is, but it's way less than 500 people. I was just lost and happened to stop in. It was, it was incredible. One of the really interesting things that I stopped at was, again, in Iowa. And the only one person died on this trip, Sergeant Floyd. Uh, and he died of what they think was appendicitis. So fairly soon into the trip, the only person who died just went ahead and got that out of the way and got that taken care of. <laughs> but it was very interesting, though, as they're thinking about the information um, that they're sharing and how the communities I'm going through are relating to, again, information, the Lewis and Clark Trail. This is a huge, huge monument. Um, and they have had several. Uh, renovations of this grave site and everything in the area this is in Sioux City Iowa everything in the area I mean not everything but lots of things in the area are named <coughs> after Sergeant Floyd so in fact I have a bottle of uh, cream soda that I bought made with real sugar on <coughs> the Sergeant Floyd Riverboat Museum <laughs> it's a riverboat out floating on the Missouri River it, I was just constantly amazed at what I was seeing. Of course, I was constantly amazed at what I was seeing in the public libraries that I knew. So I didn't realize before I left that this summer was, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this past summer, if anybody was involved in summer reading programs in your library, you saw them, the, the, it was called a Fizz Boom Read, mm -hmm. science. Did you do science programs this summer? 
Uh, no, but I made a lot of bulletin boards. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was so cool because I, I went to a couple of libraries and I'm like, oh, is that nice? You know, they're adjoining towns and they're both, they're, con they're cooperating on their fizz boom read. <coughs> I just kept seeing it and I'm like, okay, I'm just seeing a pattern here. It's been like 15 libraries and they all are doing the same thing. I think something's going on. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of science programming everywhere I went. But just the, the interesting things that they were doing. So I'm interested in geocaching. One of the things, does anybody geocache? People should geocache. You just, everyone should put up their hands, right? Linda, she's with me on this. <laughs> so the idea with geocaching is it's very much a techie, kind of nerdy librarian hobby. And things are hidden all over the place, all over the world. Um, one on the International Space Station. Um, I believe it has been retrieved now, so, so. But uh, an astronaut took it. But um, yeah, So things are hidden all over the place, and their coordinates are put up on geocaching.com, and then you can go out and find them. And then you put a little note about, yay, isn't this fun? We're all looking for things. And it's, it's an interesting way to sort of learn about a community, and then sometimes people take this a little farther, and they have themes to it. So... Many libraries now have set up geocaches as a place so that to encourage people to come to your library. So I dropped 10 travel bugs. Travel bugs are things that you put into a geocache, and they have like a little dog tag on them. So I have a fancy new kind that have a QR code. They can just be scanned on the spot. Take them back home. Um, you can type in information about it. But essentially, somebody goes and they find a cache. Um, some of mine, most of mine actually, were out in the woods or at rest stops. They pick it up and yay, look at that, one of the little travel bugs that I dropped off. So they're all, they're all little cars with these dog tags attached to them. So then when you go back to your computer and you look up the information for that specific travel bug, excuse me, it gives a link to the blog that I was keeping this summer about the trip. And it says that these, this set of travel bugs wants to go to public libraries and wants to visit libraries. So all 10 of my travel bugs have been picked up at this point. Um, they've all been moved, and one of them is at the Calgary Public Library in Alberta, Canada. Really excited. <laughs> they have amazing stuff um, in their library. I did not get to visit their library. Unfortunately, they're a little off the trail, but, uh, <laughs> but my travel bug has visited. So this kind of community involvement, oh, and this just blew me away. This is in the director's office. And uh, if you're interested in young adult crafts, apparently the young adults did this and they hot glue gunned um, crayons to paper in different kinds of designs and then took a hair dryer to it. Um, so I'm talking to this director and she's so nice and we're having such a good time and we have all this information and finally I was like, okay, look, I gotta ask, what is this down here? Wow, this is amazing. So then she's going into more detail about the programming that they were doing. All right, so stage one ended because I had to go to ALA for a while. Did anybody go to ALA this summer? It was awesome. We had such a good time. Um, it was in Las Vegas. It's hot there. Um, I thought at that point that Las Vegas was going to be my hot point of the summer, and then I'll be done with this because I'm up north. I'm guessing you've been up to where I'm going next because stage two, uh, and I'm, I'm started in Missoula, Montana, so I had to drive back across. I started in Wisconsin, that's where I live, but I'm not here. So back across Wisconsin, Minnesota, and then uh, North Dakota, that, that one gets large. And then back all the way across Montana. So I started on the far western edge of Montana and went Montana, Idaho, uh, Washington, and Oregon. Every day, it was over a hundred. What is with this? It was terrible. I had no idea. Well, okay, I should have had an idea. The night that I camped in Hell's Gate Canyon State Park. <laughs> should I? Obviously. It was a hundred and ten. This is when I developed my let's have ice cream for dinner uh, plan for the trip. There, there was a point in the trip later on when I'm having a Dairy Queen blizzard for dinner because Dairy Queen is awesome. And I had bacon jerky and I was sitting in my car with the blasting the air conditioner and eating ice cream and bacon for dinner. And I thought, you know, 
grown-ups don't do this, and I think I need a cholesterol test. <laughs> but it was fun. Yeah, a big part of, big part of traveling like this is, wh what kind of food can you have in your car that isn't going to go bad or melt? Um, bacon jerky does that beautifully. So again, I continue to be surprised. I, I, clearly, I shouldn't have at this point. But I continue to be surprised at every Lewis and Clark thing that I pass. I was in a little park. I wasn't even trying to do any Lewis and Clarky things. And they had a Lewis and Clark nature trail. I'll take the Lewis and Clark nature trail. Um, and all along, they have little signs about, well, this is what it was like for the Indians when Lewis and Clark came through. This is what they were like. This is what people were doing. Um, and sort of a happy spin on things. I was driving on a highway in uh, Washington and Oregon. I was back and forth across the border, so I never actually knew which state I was in. They would tell me, oh, well, if you drove over the Columbia River, you're in the other state. I'm like, I drove over the Columbia River five times so far today. Which state is this? Just help me out. So I, I, was, I was near the Columbia River, uh, which is gorgeous. Did I mention everything's gorgeous? It's gorgeous. Um, and I, there was a, a Lewis and Clark lookout sign off the side of the road. This is frankly where, footnote, I feel information professionals should have been involved in some of this. Because there is no master list, at least no master list that I can find, of all the things that you can see on the trail. Um, they tend to be, well, here's a sign that'll take you off of a two-lane highway, and from then on, guess. <laughs> Figure out what it is you might be looking for. It might be nothing. Um, I developed a really good sense of, mm, right, I'll go right here and see, see if that helps. And I usually stumbled into something. This specific time, I was the only person I, that I was here for about 30 minutes on the side of this little teeny road is probably an exaggeration. Um, this little teeny off-road area. And so they have nice signs here about Lewis and Clark. Uh, the bicentennial for the, 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 we celebrated the bicentennial of Lewis and Clark in 2004, and so the federal government put up lots and lots of signs. So essentially those are still there, and that's, that's still happening. But this is also, so you're looking out over this kind of swampy area, and they're talking about how depressed Lewis and Clark are because it's about November when they're there, and they're running out of food, and, and they, they think they're going to die. Um, I, however, was there in July. <laughs> it was gorgeous. It was hot. There were a lot of mosquitoes. But it could not have been prettier, and I had a Jeep with air conditioning and a GPS. So handy. But this is also a wild eagle, a wild bald eagle um, preserve area. So on the top of this hill behind me, I discovered as I was actually driving away, uh, they rescue injured eagles and uh, help <coughs> them back to health here. But you just stand here and you can just see eagles just flying all over the place. It was unbelievable. Um, oh, and then this, this is at the end. So this is, uh, this building is the Lewis and Clark uh, Visitor Center that is at the end of their trip. And they have a little coin that they had minted as out. It's a large size one that they put outside and it says, Ocean in view, oh the joy. Um, because they're really excited because they finally realized, you know what? There's a chance we're actually going to live through this. <laughs> they weren't sure at this point, but it could have happened. So I'm, I'm showing fun pictures because, well, it's cute. But <laughs> The idea, though, of information, I think this goes so strongly within the public library area. Um, you know, the, this, these are the kinds of, of information devices, tools that we could have used to help for Lewis and Clark if we had uh, been able to. Uh, this was, bottom corner here, this was my home away from home. I'm in a forest here near Mount St. Helens. Um, again, there need to be more information professionals involved in so many areas of just daily life. And daily life when you're out on the road is so much more complicated. So I'm in a forest that is gorgeous near Mount St. Helens. When I put Mount St. Helens into my GPS, 
who I've named Jane. Jane is very helpful. Uh, and I said, Jane, take me to the mountain. There's a visitor center, and I wish to see it. I have a park pass, uh, so I'm completely ready. Let's make this happen. OK, first of all, I didn't realize that I had checked the, uh, there's, when you have a GPS for your car, you can check a little box that tells it <coughs> that you want to stay on only paved roads. Mm -hmm. I had unchecked that. <laughs> <laughs> so things got interesting. Um, and Jane found a logging road. <laughs> it was, uh, it, this would have been helpful if I had had a qualified information professional along with me who knew something about the area. So yeah, I'm wandering up this mountain, there are big holes in the road, uh, I'm trying not to fall into them all. Uh, I'm very thankful that I had a Jeep. Uh, so, uh, and finally it turned into a hiking path. And Jane is like, yeah, keep going, five more miles. I'm like, Jane, at this point, I feel reality needs to intercede. <laughs> we never found Mount St. Helens, um, which seems ridiculous, doesn't it? <laughs> but me and a bunch of German tourists are standing at the spot where our GPSs had taken us all. <laughs> this is not a map. <laughs> this would have been so handy, I guess. But uh, it was a ranger station that was only open during the week but it was a ranger station for Mount St. Helens. So frankly, Garmin needs to step up their information skills. I would like to see someone be employed by Garmin, making it better. Um, I did actually find an amazing cave um, that, I don't know if you, I just saw this all over my Twitter feed recently here, a list of uh, the top thing to do in each state. Um, and it seems to be written by people who are tourists um, to do tourist things. But for Washington State, their top thing to do was this ape cave, which is where I ended up this summer. Again, more information would have been so helpful because I was reading the description of it while I'm sitting in the car out in their parking lot, and I'm like, well, okay, they have a wussy cave entrance. And I mean, that sounds like it's for little kids. Clearly, I am massively tough and macho. I do not do the wussy thing. There's a, the, what they call the upper trail of the cave. I'll do that instead, because I'm cool. So you have to have three independent sources of light with you, because it's a cave. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have a jacket, because it's 45 degrees year-round. You have to have sturdy shoes, um, because it's wet, and it's a cave. <laughs> So I completely screw this up. I mean, I have all that with me, and plus first aid supplies because I'm gonna fall down. I mean, I'm just going to. It's gonna happen. I'm ready. And uh, I completely screw up the going to the, the cave part, and I wander up the side of this mountain to the exit of the cave. Now I felt better later. Other people were doing this too, but this seemed to be what they were telling me to do. The exit of the cave is a hole in the ground about this big with a ladder. Sure. So I go down the ladder. <laughs> Seems right. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> what would you have done? <laughs> okay, you might have had some sense. That was pretty good. And, and common sense, so helpful. Uh, not just in a public library situation. Uh, so I, I wander into this big hole in the ground, and um, I'm they, they said in the directions that to do this, you, you climb over 27 um, rock piles. I climbed over two. <laughs> and has anybody been in a cave? It's really dark, right? Inexplainably dark. Your eyes do not adjust. There is nothing to adjust to. It is dark. Um, so it's me, my little headlamp, my flashlights that I'm holding in each hand. <laughs> and loose rocks underneath me, and it's dripping water all over me. Two climbing over mountain, two climbing over, two uh, big humps of rock that I climbed over, and I decided, you know what? This is a broken leg begging to happen, and it's gonna be really inconvenient for someone to have to come down here and haul me out of there, back up that ladder through the hole that's this big, <laughs> with my broken leg. I declared victory at that point, <coughs> home. Back to my home. Back to my tent, which was lovely. <laughs> and, and very pretty. But the amazing amount of information that people are conveying, um, some connected with libraries, some not. So this was a town in uh, Washington, 
um, near a lake, Sacagawea, unrelated to one that I was camping on. And what this is, it, and I tried to take a better picture, and I, I'm standing over it in every direction I could to try and get some shade, and I can't get any better picture. But this is the sun. And the local astronomy club, the local Galileo club, has set in this park a walking trail that's two or three miles long. And they start with the sun at the far edge of the park. And then they put, uh, what is that called on the map? One inch equals 500 miles scale. Or scale. All of the planets are in scale distance that you can you can walk to every planet, including Pluto, because they put it out before Pluto was declared not a planet. <laughs> I was really happy to see Pluto. It made me feel good. Um, and then every every this is a thing that you're that you can stand on on the ground or just read on the ground. It was amazing the amount of information that's available there. They all have QR codes giving more information back to them. This was um, Washington State's Stonehenge. Has anybody been to this? It's amazing. So this guy whose name eludes me at the moment, but it's somewhere here. Well, I don't remember. Um, some dude. Um, you can look him up in a minute if you need to. This was, he had traveled around Europe uh, before World War I, and he was so distraught over essentially the world coming to an end as he saw it, uh, that this is a monument to all of the soldiers from this area, from like a three or four city area, uh, who were killed in World War I. And so each one of these big flags, they're like, or 12 feet high, and they're all engraved with information about each person. It was amazing. Then back behind it uh, are monuments to uh, people from the area who've been killed in every other war since then. It was fascinating. So this guy was well, crazy. It's probably an oversimplification. I'm sure it is. But he did these amazing things, including <coughs> he set up the Mary Hill Art Museum. This is an unbelievable world-class museum with some of the most amazing things that I've ever seen in a museum. And I mean, see where we are, I've been to these. It was at least as good. Um, and it is literally in the middle of nowhere. There is nothing around it. There are no cities. There are no big towns. Just little rural nothing. Um, it was it's phenomenal. If you ever get a chance to go to uh, the Mary Hill Museum of Art, it's in it's officially in Goldendale, Washington. Maryhillmuseum.org. It's unbelievable. Oh, and then this this one on the top. I was just I was so amused by this and so impressed. So this is the Troutdale, Troutdale, Oregon, Washington. One of those. Uh, train museum and I thought okay I'll run in look at the trains run back out call it a day I ran in and the woman who runs this was all over me she <laughs> gave me a guided tour she's showing me every single thing in the museum it was phenomenal and I thought this is exactly the way public libraries should be this is what we should be doing so all of the libraries that I visited talk about the community outreach that they do and the community programming that they're doing and reaching out to different kinds of groups. And I said, literally, some of us are going to need to be, as I need to be here, taken by the hand and walked through the entire process. The advocacy that she was showing was just phenomenal. So this, the far side here, was uh, one of the uh, scientists that I got to see at the Fizboom Reed, the mad scientist. Uh, they did all kinds of cool things. So I walked in on several libraries that were having um, programs um, where they had like mad scientists in long coats. And there was one that I, they came in just as they had finished and like stuff had exploded all over the room. <laughs> I mean, it was easily cleaned up stuff, but still. And it was all foamy and there was foam everywhere and it smells terrible. And it's great. <laughs> it's, it's very exciting stuff. <coughs> This library was in the tiniest little place, 
and it was served by a couple of different libraries. So I talked with the director, the director was the director of three different small libraries. So I talked with him at one library that he was at that was closed for the day, but he was there. And then he just told me to go, yeah, go to the city hall over in the next town and just ask them for the key, and they'll let you in to see this library. This is the entire library. <laughs> but it's a town, again, that has like 300 people. And the programming that they did was really impressive. So in this town of, again, like 300, I'm guessing 300 people, um, they have a Lego club. So they're encouraging everyone to come in and play Legos. Um, they were really pushing. Uh, they had the Mango uh, foreign language instruction programs. They were really pushing that. Um, and they were doing a lot of work with uh, senior citizens in terms of, I think they had like social security programs. Um, they had something about like writing your will, uh, estate planning, things like that. They were doing programming in this place. This is a theme that I heard over and over again from the librarians that we're not here just to be a warehouse for books. We are involved in our communities. So some of these things that I've been talking about so far, some of them libraries were involved with, and some of them libraries were not, but I feel like there are good, good community messages to learn from. Stage three, I'm going now back across Montana and North Dakota. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Montana because it's a really big state. And Montana is my new favorite place to live that's not here. Um, yeah, someday. The number of libraries that I visited that are not only thinking about kind of the traditional ways of serving their libraries, but also this was in a very small rural community, but people still have the internet at home. It's hard to get the internet when you're not either at home or in the library. But they said a lot of their people have it. And so they can do they can do outreach, they have audiobooks, and they've got the overdrive system. People are getting things from them. But this was a traveling exhibit going around Montana on the history of women, um, women settlers to the, the western area, specifically in Montana. And the State Archives of Montana had put this together, and they were sending it around the state. So the day that I was here was actually its last day of being on view, and it was getting ready to go to another uh, community. One thing that I loved about this library is this is an old bank building. <laughs> I drove past it <laughs> because I wasn't sure if that was in the right place. Um, and I came back around, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that was definitely it. And it's a big circular, if you think about like buildings from the 60s, banks from the 60s. Some of you have seen this on TV. <laughs> um, but, uh, but big old round buildings. And this is a big old round building. In the basement, they have a bank vault, and they're doing programming in it. <laughs> Kansas City, Kansas Public Library also has a bank vault in the basement of their library, and they are putting together, uh, or they have a, they got a grant, and they have movie theater seats in there, and a screen, and they show old movies every Thursday, I believe. Um, it was amazing, and so, but you have the big bank vault door there, although both libraries were careful to tell me, we have removed the blocking <laughs> mechanism. <laughs> Because, yeah, you don't want somebody locking their brother in there. <laughs> Kid is there for a week or something. Kids are resilient. <laughs> but again, thinking about being part of the community. This was a little, uh, a very small library in North Dakota. And this was on an honor system. But they had the, the K-cups and all the coffee things. I was in at least two other libraries that had the Keurig machines and then the vending machine next to it has, um, for a dollar, you get a cup, um, one of the little K-cups, and uh, sugar, and whatever you put in the coffee. But that's amazing. I mean, that's thinking about what people want. And it's not a lot of work for the library. You don't have to have like a full-time barista working for you. You just have your vending machine guy come by and fill things up. I was constantly shocked at what people are doing. So this is what the general, this is the Lewis and Clark trail signs. Um, and sometimes he's pointing the other way. Inevitably, he's pointing the direction I don't want to turn. And so I'm nervous because I feel like 
well, would, would, would Mary Brother Lewis steer me wrong? He would. <laughs> he did. Um, but he steered himself right, so that worked out. Um, it was very interesting, again, because I think so much of what's happening in the communities has to necessarily inform the public library, inform what's going on in it. So I mentioned fracking earlier. So I'm near the shores of beautiful, I'm not kidding, beautiful Lake Sakakawea in North Dakota. And to get to that, you drive through all of this area that's um, covered in oil, uh, oil rigs, big oil factories. Um, things are burning everywhere, which scared me. Um, but right at the, where the state park is, the Lewis and Clark State Park, where it starts, they have a big sign up saying, no oil industry allowed here, or something like that. Um, and then you drive into it, and suddenly you're in this amazing, beautiful park. And I got a really nice cabin. At this point, I'm just showing off, because at this point in my trip, I was so <laughs> exhausted, I could like hardly think anymore. And yeah, I can see my emails that I'm typing back home are increasingly disjointed. <laughs> I, I have no idea what's happening anymore, help me. <laughs> But I actually had to sleep in a bed. It was very cool. Um, but just that information um, changes the way the community works so that they did not actually have a public library in this community. But it was interesting, though, to see the way that these things are, are working through um, and providing not only money for the libraries, but providing jobs for the community, providing information and resources for public libraries that they may, may or may not otherwise have had. The dinosaur there is from Glendive, North Dakota, and uh, the citizens of Glendive had all volunteered and worked together back in the 30s when they were finding this enormous dinosaur skeleton. Um, so the, in recognition of all their volunteer work, the scientists uh, donated to them a statue of the, of the dinosaur that they had found. The perspective is a little off there, but it's about 20 feet high. It's really big <laughs> when you look up at it. But again, that kind of information, I think, is, is important. All right. So the data collection was the, was the truly interesting part, I think, of this study. The data analysis is still in progress, but I've, I've reached the end of the collection part. So the, the far left-hand photo there, that's everything that I collected. So every library that I went to, I did a survey where I asked them again about the past, the present, and their future. But I also picked all the handouts. I picked up all the handouts that they had. Um, some libraries like, gave me copies of their strategic plan. Some co some gave me copies of other kinds of documents. Some gave me um, historical records that they put together for their centennials and things. It was just it was amazing. Every single library I went to had something interesting, neat, unique, and amazing. And because I'm a librarian, these are all the books that I bought after swearing that I would never buy any books over the summer, none, none at all, um, and having no room at all in my Jeep. Um, yeah, I bought a lot of books. It was a good summer. So I just have a little bit of um, data here to share, and I'm obviously happy to talk about in more, more detail um, at a future date. But you can see I spent a lot of time in Montana. Um, Missouri was also had a lot of libraries. Washington and Oregon had a lot of libraries. Some of these other ones, it wasn't that Nebraska is not a small state. In fact, it's kind of a fantastic state. I was born there. But um, I had been back since I was born, so I, we moved when I was six months old, and this was my first trip back to uh, Nebraska. It was nice. They've done a good job. But <laughs> you like to be proud, right, of your community. Um, but just because I was following the river, and the river tended to go between the two states. So one of the things that I asked as I was thinking about historical um, records of the library was, are you in the Carnegie Library? And I was not at all surprised that most of them had not been. In fact, I was a little surprised um, at this one. Does anybody want to take a couple of wild guesses as to why libraries out west would not have potentially been Carnegie Libraries? I feel like what I'm hearing from you is that <laughs> it's because the libraries were started after Carnegie was funding them. They're new. In Boston, you know, something that's from 1850, 
I mean, that's practically last week here. Right? <laughs> yeah, out west, it's not that way. Um, in fact, I was in several library communities that didn't get started. The library didn't get started until the 40s or 50s. I was surprised at the number of libraries that were started by women's groups. Um, most people didn't, or a lot of people didn't know how their library had started necessarily, but if they knew, if they knew who it was that had gotten started, it was the local women's group. I ask about skills for the future, and I'm sorry, I know this is difficult to read. Um, it's better when I have my hand out. But what library people are looking for is communication. So they want you to be able to communicate with people in person. And I asked about online communication, and they had less need for that, or they said they had less need for that. I feel like I think that's not correct. <laughs> and, uh, this is also uh, something terribly important. Self-motivation and flexibility, though, were other things that they very definitely said that that's what they're looking for in a librarian, particularly in a public library where things are a little chaotic. Things happen. Yes, are you asking me specifically of library directors what they're needing? I was asking specifically of whoever I was talking to in the library. Sometimes it was the director, sometimes it was other managers. Um, once, I think it was a circulation kid. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it was very interesting. Some libraries were very prepared. Um, one of the libraries in Montana, uh, the library Billings, he had get convened all of his senior managers from around the system to meet with me around the table, and it was very formal, and I was like, I don't really, I, I'm, I'm just not wearing my jeans today. I'm pretty sure everything I'm wearing today is clean. So, uh, um, and in other places it was a little more casual and they didn't necessarily know that I was coming, even though we had emailed them um, at least twice to tell them when I was going to be there. And so they were like, oh, okay, let me show you around the library. It was very interesting. Um, oh, there was supposed to be another slide in there. Well, anyway, um, one of the in conclusion, because we're, we're running out of time here. Definitely what I got from the communities that I visited and the public libraries that were in these communities is that people are feeling the need for public libraries to continue to exist. That there is no talk about getting rid of public libraries. There was no talk in the libraries about how, well, you know what, we sort of don't need to be here anymore. And instead, it's very much moving, though. The idea seems to be moving from what we do with our books and providing paper books to how do we provide books, but also how do we have community programs? How do we reach out to our communities? A lot of these rural places that I was in, which is a lot of the country, they said, we have to have a library because there is literally nowhere else for our community members to meet. Winters are cold and long fun and there's nothing to do over the winter they need to come here and have a place and very much they need to come here and have an access to technology um, the only place that I could get internet for most of my trip or the occasional nights I stayed in a hotel when I was at a laundromat I would sit in the back of the Jeep and type for about three hours and that was all the laundromat password would hold out for <laughs> and libraries so after I would visit libraries during the day I would leave and go do my thing and I'd come back later and be like, hi, can I get your internet password? Because um, I need to be on the computer. <laughs> Libraries serve a lot of important needs in a community. So we serve books, but we also serve people. And I really think that's, that's the big thing to take away from what I learned from this. And that's what the librarians themselves were emphasizing, is we're a people profession. So go forth and be prepared to do good customer service. And can I have my papers back? <laughs> <laughs>